Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session of Linux Conf AU. Um, our next presenter is Stuart Smith, who will be uh, showing us some stuff about testing firmware on power. Please make him feel welcome. Thank you. I'm Stuart. I work for IBM. Uh, the illustrious title of Opal Architects, which basically means I maintain a whole bunch of firmware for power systems. Uh, so this, uh, this talk is a bit of a combination of things. Uh, if you're a hardcore Python developer, this is probably akin to an intense horror movie, and uh, weeping is uh, allowed, um, and uh, self-care is, is also available. Uh, if you're uh, otherwise into firmware, this might also be interesting. Uh, so last year I spoke about organizational change, uh, and the year prior to that I talked a bit about firmware, and this is kind of a whole mishmash of things. But to start off, what's a few definitions? So what is power? Well, it's a CPU architecture. So, you know, it's not just your same x86 chip, it's a different one, different instruction set. Uh, power 9 is a new CPU. If you're around for Hughes Keynote, you may have seen a, a die going around. Um, usually they're in a little module and plugged into a computer. Uh, you know, 24 cores, uh, SMT4, 14 nanometer. Uh, we have PCIe Gen 4. I think it's the first chip to ship with Gen 4. Yep, which is kind of cool and exciting. Uh, there's uh, open cappy stuff happening there, so coherent accelerator buses, and NVLink 2 for connecting to GPUs and being really nice and fast. So this is a Power 9 computer. Uh, we call it Witherspoon because you know, the very first code name someone ever mentions is the thing you will call it from, from then on, and it doesn't matter what marketing comes up with, because they're wrong. Uh, if you publicly know it, it'll be the IBM AC922, which is a distinctly less cool name. Um, and it's the first Power 9 system to ship. Uh, so it's part of the Coral Labs uh, supercomputer stuff that is you know, video on, this on the internet of many of these machines going in, uh, and you know, there's more Power 9 systems to come, but this is sort of the first out the door. And when I say pre-release everything, I really do actually mean pre-release everything. So usually I believe we don't do a second revision on the case, like the actual physical chassis, I think is like, you know, you do it once and you're done. Uh, except there was a Power 8 machine once where the front bezel had to be remade because you couldn't press the power button. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> at which point I apologise to everyone on that phone call where for 10 minutes I was astounded we shipped physical power buttons. <laughs> it's like, doesn't everyone do this remotely? Why would you not? Um, so apologies to those people. Uh, so the planer itself, as in the motherboard there, of course, goes through revisions. Uh, so, you know, like any complex bit of kit, you may have to fix something up. And in the meantime, you know, some fun workarounds are had and someone gets to be in the lab with a soldering iron and do some surface mount, tiny little soldering and wrap wires around and hope for the best or you try for some software workarounds. Uh, so you have a few revisions of that. Uh, so the bug that, you know, you ever find when making the machine could be, eh, the circuit board's wrong. Um, that could be certainly it. Uh, the BMC in this uh, machine uh, is OpenBMC, uh, and that's a relatively new project. It was in a very limited scale on one of the P8 systems, uh, the Barrel Eye system, and in this, it's like, this is it, fully open source BMC stack, uh, which is a wonderful thing to behold, because, you know, why have proprietary BMCs? Uh, and so the interactions with it are gonna be different, so the bug could be in the BMC. Uh, and that's all pre-release software. I think the hardware itself there is, you know, of a GA level there. I don't think we got pre-release BMC chips, but, you know, the bring-up was definitely done early. Uh, the RAM is probably production level. I'm pretty sure we're not running pre-release RAM modules just to, you know, add to the fun. There's been revisions in the fans, so the fans cooling it. There's definitely been revisions there. So, you know, you have pre-release fans and, and things change. So, you know, thermal problems could be a bug in the fans. Um, uh, CPUs, first silicon. Uh, which is always fun. Uh, you know, we joke about in software, if it compiles, ship it. I assure you they do a slightly more testing of that for silicon before they go and build a giant new fab and, and tape out silicon. Um, but, you know, bugs in the chip are a reality. Um, that's just, you know, how it goes. It's hardware is always perfect no matter what, right? <laughs> so, yes, the, the bug can be in the chip. Uh, and then we have, you know, Interesting errata there. Uh, we also have PCI cards sitting in there, and we do deal with pre-release PCI cards, right? First chip doing PCIe Gen 4, well, everyone's producing a PCI card that's Gen 4, guess what? They're in a similar boat. So the bug could be with the card itself, it could be with the firmware on the card, it could be your interactions with that, all sorts of fun. Uh, GPUs, uh, this ships with a new NVIDIA GPU, uh, 
So they're also doing first silicon and bring up. Uh, and so now you've got you know, two large complex processors in a machine talking together and working together that are both coming on on first silicon. Uh, so that's kind of fun. The, doing all this stuff, simu simulation stuff beforehand is like kind of fascinating. Um, if you want to see what NVIDIA does, they've actually got a blog post on some of their simulation gear from a few years ago, which is pretty funky. It's like giant supercomputer and really slow graphics card out the end. <laughs> you a normal PC with the world's slowest NVIDIA card. Uh, and sort of the subset of firmware that, that I maintain uh, interacts with most of this in some way or another. And we have, you know, behind it and, and beside it, you know, other bits of firmware we, we interact with. As well, of course, we have a Linux kernel running. And so it is distinctly possible, and I have heard rumors that there also may be bugs in Linux. So it is decidedly possible that, you know, it's not a firmware bug, it's actually a kernel bug. And then you get to have the debate of, you know, where do we fix it and how do we fix it so that you don't just go, everyone update everything because it's all terrible. But, uh, you know, we have a bit of a, a get out of jail free card there as we've not been uh, hypervisor compatible kernels between CPU generations. So we have a little bit get out of jail free earlier on. Uh, and of course, what do people expect from this computer at the end of it after we've gone through, you know, bring up and development and release it? Well, they expect something that I view as a highly unreasonable request. They want it to boot, right? No one else thinks that's entirely unreasonable. Not only that, you know, they want to reboot it and it to boot reliably. And I use the same video from last time. So Cyril's context switch kernel uh, appears gratuitously. Um, and that's actually a P8 system, but it looks the same. I couldn't be bothered recording one. Uh, and especially if you've paid like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for a supercomputer, you really do actually want your computers to boot. Um, and to do that, of course, you need firmware, and firmware does a lot of things. It's not like back in the early 80s where it was like apply power to a, a rail on the chip and suddenly things execute as well as they're ever going to execute. Uh, we need to do things like uh, we have a processor that turns on the main core and then in it's that and sets everything up correctly so you can execute these magic instructions on a fast computer. You need to set up memory, you need to train memory, you need to set up PCI, you need to start talking to a BMC, you need to start doing every single little bus around the place and then work out how you interface with uh, I2C masters, how do you interface with other bits of firmware, like the bit of thing doing hard thermal limits, how do you then talk to the BMC properly about that because it may also want to know information and then pass little things like sensors around and all of that thing and then give a label to a PCI slot so you can say that card died and it's located in slot five. Um, best bug ever was someone didn't notice for a long time that five was actually labeled four on the motherboard on something else. But uh, you know, all of that's a distinctly possible bug as well. Uh, and we have a new fun uh, for or P8 and P9. Uh, we have the Open Power Foundation, where we're going, you going there, you should definitely talk to you about Open Power. But with Power 8, it was like initially IBM shipped a system and then other people made systems. With Power 9, we involved others from the start, like really, really early on. Um, and at some point through open power, we're wanting a lot of people to make machines, and already a lot of people do, but as that ecosystem grows, we might want something like a firmware compliance test suite that we have reasonable confidence in as both you know, firmware engineers and, and kernel engineers that it does actually work properly. We're not really in the business of wanting to work around random bits of firmware bugs that other people have written. It's annoying enough when we have to do it for ourselves. So you know, reducing that is always good. Uh, we also don't have like some grand uh, architected spec of necessarily all of the firmware interfaces. This is definitely something that has uh, wonderfully in evolved, but it also has the benefit of shipping, and you also have the benefit of having the source code, which also helps. So the initial uh, thing is like firmware starts pretty early. So you know, I said this shipped at the end of last year, like you know, December 22nd or something, a new system's coming. Turns out it was in February 2017 that Mikey added Witherspoon, and apologies for not adding the ASCII art back in, Mikey. Um, and I say from the start, as in the uh, Google and Rackspace platform known as Barrel I2 or Zayas to us, uh, also again, sorry about the lack of ASCII art, was actually added a month before. So the system not being built by IBM was actually added before the one being built by IBM into firmware. Uh, if you look at the BMC side of things, uh, you know, also a project to engineer an open source BMC, this started even earlier than that, right? This uh, 
This started around mid-2016, Bring Up was being done on the, on the Witherspoon BMC platform. So that's in a little card you plug in, and so there was like it with the power supply and leads going into it, trying to get it, hey, it boots, now we've booted the computer that we need to boot the computer. Well, actually, you've booted the computer that you need to boot the computer that boots the computer. There's another layer in there. It's like there is just turtles all the way down. Uh, and <laughs> I haven't found like a 6502 in there, but there is like an M68K in the BMC, so you know along with the ARM, because you need another computer next to your other computer uh, that's next to your other computer that's got other computers in it. And we added up how many things were like Turing complete one day, and it's like, you know, a 24 core system, and we added up like, I don't know, 60 different things that would definitely be Turing complete in, inside the box. It was just wonderfully crazy. Um, so I'm not going to really talk about the VMC, uh, but I will talk about host firmware. And for that, it's about one-ish, 1 1.1 1 .1 million uh, lines of code that are power firmware specific. And we use uh, a user space program called Pettyboot as a bootloader. So you turn on the machine and from PNOR Flash, we boot up a Linux kernel and display a UI to say which kernel do you want to boot from which disk, and that's just a Linux user space process. Because, well, who wants to write a driver in something that isn't Linux? Do you want to, who wants to write a driver in fourth? Yeah, no one. Okay, some people have questionable life goals. Uh, <laughs> who wants to write a UEFI, dri UEFI driver? Even fewer people than want to write a driver in fourth. Who wants to then have to do that and write a driver for the Linux kernel and then make them both work really well? No one. So you just write it once in Linux and we're done. And then also you can debug the UI bit because it's user space and you can do crazy things like attach GDB to it or run it on other computers or ship it on other computers. So other people actually ship the same UI uh, that we do, and in fact, it originated on like the PlayStation 3. So it was like this lovely bit of, you know, use everything nice. And this sort of million lines of code here, uh, if you actually add up every other line of code, it's like 30 something, 40, some ridiculous number of millions of lines of code that we build as little of as possible to fit it in Flash. Uh, but we interact with a lot of hardware, right? So you look at the die shot, and you've got, well, we've got a whole bunch of PCI things we're going to have to talk about, talk to. We've got, you know, SMP and accelerator signaling that's going to talk to other things attached to it. Memory, everything goes wrong once you start memory. Um, and besides, we have so much L3 cache. I mean, you know, if you had a computer 20 years ago, it had less memory in it than we have L3 cache. Like, surely that's enough. Yeah, no one buys that when I say. <laughs> But, you know, we've got on-chip accelerators we want to talk to. Uh, then we have, you know, the cores themselves. Uh, so there's a lot of things we talk to. Plus, it's not just a chip, right? It goes into a computer. And they have other things in them because people insist on having things like disks or network cards or other such weird and wonderful PCI devices that they plug in and chain it. So how do we test all of this? And how do we know that firmware is okay? Especially, you know, we're making a change to firmware. How do we know that, you know, we could ship this to customers? Well, it's easy, of course. For boots, ship it. Right? It doesn't have to, like, compile or ship it. It's just, oh, boots are fine. Um, or double bonus points for if it reboots, then definitely ship it. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's perfect. There's the, the height of perfection there. And I'd say, uh, you know, this is probably the minimal, minimal uh, quality that you'd kind of want from your firmware is to somewhat reliably turn the computer on. Uh, and of course, sometimes the test suite doesn't. So this is like a month ago. We discovered one of the test suites that was the, uh, uh, the sort of, you know, just the little smoke test of does this thing boot uh, for a long time was actually not. So you'd crash immediately, well before memory came up, let alone other CPU cores, <laughs> with like random corruption. Well, not random, we did sort it out. And it's like, well, that turns out not to have been caught. So obviously there was a bug in that test case, which is an old one from the one I'm talking about. Um, and so back to Power 8 days, so the previous generation processor, uh, testing was very much how you'd expect for uh, sort of a, something that was becoming open from a very monolithic development environment, you know, where it's one company and sort of one team that's building everything from the, not quite the sand, well, lit, yeah, the sand up, right, silicon up. Uh, so there was very much a kind of, you know, repeating waterfall thing of dev test ship that you went, didn't I read about this in textbooks, um, that uh, didn't seem to have, you know, good accounts into catching re re regressions early. Uh, there was, you know, large groups of people, almost 
tapping on keyboards and doing things a bit too manually for you know, my liking. Uh, but you know, we definitely shipped a product, uh, several products, and you know, we still got to Power 9. So it did work, but you know, it could obviously be done better. Uh, and there was definitely not something that was easy for me to go as a firmware engineer to go, I run this command, it talks to a computer and tells me whether I've just merged code that's rubbish or not. Because that's like the ultimate thing. I want you know, something nice and simple. And so I've talked a little bit about what firmware is, and I'd say firmware is big. So in order to try and explain some of this to a bunch of people, which is actually orthogonal to this talk, I created a simplified overview of the firmware development process for what we ship, um, uh, which was a exercise in how you can crash graphviz and dot. Uh, so if anyone wants to look at a lot of seg faults of graphviz and dot, just take this source and change anything of it. So this is a rough overview of the firmware development process, and the little purple circles down the bottom are things that you might flash onto a computer, and everything else is where where code comes from. And I've done a lovely simple thing. One of these boxes here is for Linux development. And I've said LKML goes to like a release and then the stable tree, because everyone knows kernel development is that simple. But it was also to try and get across the point of that we're reusing so much of this infrastructure for a whole bunch of our parts. And then we have our own sort of custom internal bits. And you know, the more we reuse, the better. And you know, that this is a lovely complex operation. Um, so that's the simplified view of the world uh, for firmware development. Um, and so if you think about it, firmware testing is a large integration testing effort. And indeed, a bunch of the work can be spent of working out, where is this bug? Is it something we've just exposed and has always been there? Is it in our interactions with another bit of firmware? Is it the buggy place? Is it the chip? Is that instruction actually doing what you think it's doing you know, at that specific time? You know, all of these things is a large integration test effort. So it really is a bunch of the time is not necessarily spent you know debugging your problem, but it is finding out where is that problem. And a lot of the time, you'll punt bugs around to other groups. So it's really critical that you have good ways of communicating what you have done to create a problem that you think is in someone else's area of expertise. So what about existing tests? Um, we have a bunch of various uh, bits of testing around the place, of course. Um, we have a hardware exerciser that's uh, up on GitHub as well called HTX, and that job is to basically run through every possible path of instructions and stress test the chip and find what weird things happen. Like, you know, if you run, you run a whole bunch of integer workload for a very long time, you know, it better not just, you know, hit thermal limits and catch fire, right? That would be a bad thing. Um, and it also should give correct results and other such things. So we didn't want to replace that, and that was an existing thing. It was much more of a finding fault with hardware than necessarily a bunch of the firmware, but, you know, it does catch firmware bugs, but it wasn't designed to catch firmware bugs, right? Uh, we have unit tests in firmware. We definitely have that. Uh, we have like kernel self-tests, and some of those have been useful around the place. Uh, there's KVM tests for testing a whole bunch of KVM things. Um, and there's a lot of incidentally tested firmware, right? Odds are if you can run like, you know, KVM tests, a hardware exerciser, and like, you know, a database for a while, you know, odds are firmware's okay, like somewhat okay. You know, the box hasn't just, you know, crashed suddenly as soon as you did any PCI traffic or something. Um, and at some point, there wasn't you know, too much that was you know, intentional, uh, and nothing that brought all this together. Um, and so other things I had you know, around uh, for doing some firmware testing is we did you know, Travis, uh, so it just like, builds and runs some stuff in a simulator. Uh, and yes, that CentOS 6 one is a sporadic failure because Docker and Travis are excellent. Um, but you know, we run a whole bunch of unit tests there across every possible development platform that any engineer may possibly try and build and build our firmware on. Uh, we do like GCOV for unit tests because you know, if you're unit testing your allocator, you probably want to test that you're testing all the code paths in that or you know, your printf function because this is firmware and we don't have fancy things like libc. Uh, we have to have our own. Uh, you want to test that you, know, you can parse data structures you pass to and from other bits of firmware. You might want to you know, fuzz test them and inject errors and stuff like that. So we have you know, GCOV for that. Um, and you can get, you know, nicely tweak it and get a bit more coverage. But that, of course, doesn't really deal with anything that deals with hardware. You can't really unit test you know, a device driver too hard. We even have GCOV for booting. Uh, so I did a whole bunch of hackery to be able to dump out a part of firmware memory and then parse through the GCOV data structures and get reports of, of booting. So this is actually how little firmware code is executed out of our project when you boot the machine to a login prompt. Right? And it's, it's scary, and you look at it, and you're like, that's like next to nothing. Right? Uh, and so obviously, booting to a 
you know, does it boot, ship it, is not a particularly good even line code coverage test uh, for firmware. Um, and as a maintainer, uh, a question that you constantly ask yourself whenever you get mail to the list is, will I regret merging this patch? Right? It may look correct, and sometimes you get patches that are correct, but in fact they're not because hardware. Yeah, or software, or some other bit of firmware. And you get this, this interesting thing of, you know, you must take into account this, and like, is it going to cause some weird regression somewhere I haven't thought of? Is it, in, in, is it suitably you know, changing something that we interface with another bit of thing in a way that will fail gracefully and backwards compatible? Because not everyone updates all of their firmware all at once, especially if you're a developer, and not everyone updates to the latest you know, kernel every single time, so you want to make sure that everything really works well. Uh, and I don't want to be in a situation where you know, I merge code and then four days later someone in a build team builds an official build and then a week later someone from the test team files a bug and then three days later we get all in the information we could possibly use to diagnose that problem and then finally get a bug report of code you merged two weeks ago. Like that's not ideal. So I want something to run. And I want to catch bugs early and often. Um, I don't want to break other teams. I want to say that pretty much always you could build and boot your machine off Ski Boot Master or indeed OP Build Master, and you'd have a reasonable assurance that this would work. Well, at least as well as you know, pre-release hardware would work, but definitely on released hardware. You know, want to be able to run daily builds. And you know, Sam's even been working on like petty boot UIs. We could even have like auto update firmware. New firmware is available, and we just reboot your machine with new firmware. And during development, the idea is we could do that like daily and make everyone in the company run. This is today's firmware. If you get a problem, if there is something we need to fix. So that's you know in the pipeline. Uh, and I started to ask around, like, how do we actually test things before we release them? Like, even in this funny cycle of, you know, send it over somewhere and a test team magically reports a bug, what, what happens? And so I found sort of a bunch of internal sort of partly automated testing. Uh, a lot of it was run on a pool of machines in Austin, or actually in a specific building in Austin, that's the IBM building. Uh, and a bunch of these had mounted AFS file systems, there's like globally shared ones between them, uh, or some other form of random network file system that has a wonderful web interface to it that is so 1990s. It's like just spectacular. Uh, they all run RHEL 6, so it has all of the modern tooling you'd expect. Uh, there was a bunch of very hard coded scripts because you should definitely execute out of some random directory on a shared file system parts of your testing. Um, and it, I was trying to extract some of this information. I didn't actually have permissions to read any of these directories, weirdly enough, or really who wants to mount a file system from the other side of the planet anyway. Uh, NFS runs really well when you do that. Uh, so I had a look around and started asking other people, and I found test frameworks. Yes, plural, because someone has a bright idea that they should really write like a bit of a way to write tests of test frameworks for testing machines. So what they do is create a test framework, then write a unit test in it, like, you know, power on the machine and see if login appears. And then the next person comes along and says, you know what would be really good if we had a test framework? And then they wrote a different test framework and then implemented their one test. Uh, and so there was a lot of them. Um, and uh, I'm going to steal uh, uh, XKCD here. Uh, I didn't want to write another set of unit tests. So there was also this idea of that we should have an open power, uh, or an open source open power test suite that we could give to people and perhaps people joining the foundation to build machines would want to run. Um, and we'd also at some point want firmware that complied to some sort of standard. At some point we're not going to personally know everyone who's building firmware for a machine. Uh, so one of the guys in Austin, Andrew Geisler, uh, grabbed a whole bunch of the internal things, massaged them to something you could run on something that wasn't a specific pool of machines sitting in IBM in Austin with specific file systems mounted, and turned that into something and pushed it to GitHub, which is in itself a pretty pretty wonderful thing to get done in you know, not too much of a time. And that was you know, late 2015 here. Uh, so this was kind of cool, because we then had a goal, right? And this was something started there of testing for an open source project as an open source project, because firmware for us is an open source project. So we may as well have the testing for that firmware to be an open source project, which sounds like a great thing. So what was there at the start? Well, there was a Perl script. Uh, you may notice the title of this talk probably has a spoiler on what ended up happening. Um, but this was rather incidental, because it was a Perl script that called system a lot. You definitely called system a lot, because that's the way you write Perl. There's no function in Perl to create a directory. 
um, and then parsed XML with system grep-v, <laughs> piped to grep-v, which calls another script that was Perl via system uh, that then passes data to that via environment variables, uh, which calls another Perl script to parse different XML in a different way, using libxml in Perl that time, uh, to work out what to pass to a shell script, uh, which then constructs a Python script, <laughs> which then runs a test that looked oddly like the test was written in Python, uh, for example, like IPMI tool power on and see if the machine boots. And that was probably not the most ideal place to start, but there were tests written, like down there in the corner, there was actually a test that was run that like did power on the machine and see if you got to log in and there was you know, a whole bunch of incidental IPMI things and everything else that you'd run uh, there as well. So there were some tests there, it was just this layers of stuff around it, no doubt because, you know, in three days, pulling together everything from very custom internal something out, that's what happens, which is fine. And I just wanted something that was like, oh, you know, whenever you're at Python code, just run a unit testy thing and things are magic, or like, you know, make check is what you usually do. Like, why don't we have something as, as simple as that and that's really easy to get started and, and write new things? And uh, I wanted to encourage people to write tests and say, not so much send me a bug report on Bugzilla or anything, but rather send me a pull request to a test suite with a bit of Python code or a bit of Perl code or, bit, or whatever, I don't care. If it's some like reproducible test case to reproduce things, how would, good would that be? And so there was not just organizational change here to change to a culture of, you know, the test suite is a deliverable. Uh, I wanted to also, of course, you know, clean up the code and have it something that I'm very happy with, you know, adding tests to and running individual ones and then, you know, run specific tests in a loop and all kind of that thing. And, you know, we had test teams and they were often always, you know, engaged in testing machines before they go out and in various ways. So, you know, we had that and we also didn't want to, you know, stop releasing computers for a long time. Uh, we had, you know, you know, some turnover in those teams as well. So you needed to, you know, bring people on board and make them feel like they're really valuable uh, and indeed have them be valuable. Uh, we had some automated tests, right? We had some people working on and CI running, even if it was RHEL 6 and sometimes not always checking the computer actually booted. Uh, but, you know, we had some existing unit tests in this sort of initial uh, OP test framework, right? And, you know, I didn't want to invent another standard or another bit of infrastructure, and I was basically going, I'm going to evolve this, right? I'm going to take what all the work people have done so far and, like, redo chunks until I like it. And this comes to an idea that I have between innovation tokens and spoon theory as applied to software engineering, right? You do any big project, you have a certain number of innovation tokens. And we're definitely spending all our innovation tokens on like hardware, doing Linux on bare metal and doing wonderful, you know, KVM things there, getting a new chip out, interfacing with GPUs in interesting ways. That's where our innovation tokens are spent. Um, we don't want to overspend on innovation tokens. So it's gonna be like conservative, right? Uh, spoon theory, right? I personally have so many spoons and, you know, Firmware maintainer is one, trying to do other bits of change, rah, 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 there's definitely did not have an excess of spoons uh, to go and, and run too many things. Uh, you know, involved in firmware maintainership, Open Power Foundation, trying to get, you know, development organizations to be more open sourcey rather than internal, right? Lots of things, not many spoons. So failure wasn't an option because we had a highly compressed schedule and I wanted something that definitely helped me test firmware. Uh, I'm also not a Python programmer. Right, and you know, go look at the code there, and you'll have a bit of a cry. But you know, it's on GitHub, so patch is welcome. Uh, and so, why not rewrite it all from scratch to be very elegant? I'm like, well, I wanted to. I had limited time, right? You know, full time job otherwise, and you know, we didn't have full time engineers on this. Uh, so, if I could do it gradually, but get people to adopt things that were already there, which they already were, like that, we had test teams running this test suite. So, if I could progressively change it, I'd bring everyone along with them. And I started to have this idea of tests are a deliverable. Right? So you have, here's the repository with the firmware you build for the machine, here's the repository with the test suite you run for the machine. And then, you know, run this option and it's suddenly a firmware compliance test. And the whole submit your firmware for compliance testing could be, here is the results of this test project at this version. How good would that be? It's like, make check, give us the results, is the exit code zero? You're done. Right? And so I had this strategy of slowly boiling the frog not realize, have people not realize I was taking them on this journey to this, this area and also end up implementing something really good so you would use it out of preference, not because someone told you to. So short term wins were like add tests and run them. I got, yeah, a test team started to do that and increase the testing there. Um, and of course, you know, what do we test? It's a computer, we turn it on, we turn it off, we check, do we still boot the OS that was released earlier on? We 
test, you know, do we still boot you know, a modern kernel, run various commands, you know, check that we can change CPU frequency, check that we can enter and disable certain stop states, check that all the PCI devices showed up that did last time you booted. Right, actually that did spot several bugs. You just boot the machine, LSPCI, boot the machine again, LSPCI, diff. If there's a change, something could be wrong unless someone's gone to the computer and steals PCI cards. <sighs> I actually plug more in, I try to. Um, you know, do I squared C operations work? Uh, can we talk to the BMC? Uh, do we have uh, all of this basic functionality? We don't want to replace a whole bunch of test suites necessarily, like things I mentioned like HTX and other exercises, but we could run them as part of this, like maybe I should. Not the full suite that you burn in a machine for a week to see if you know, something goes wrong, but I could run part of that as well. How do we report test results? Well, you know, we want log files on failure to try and work out what's going on. Maybe this is a whole bunch of, you know, kernel logs, something there, or the IBM parlance is first failure data capture. But I also want at the end of like, this is how many tests are run, this is what failed, and here's the little bit of context around that. Uh, and, you know, one major refactor later, sorry, I don't have a SpongeBob thing, but uh, I'm abusing Python unit test, because it turns out Python unit test provides all sorts of these things for me. And it's not so much unit tests when it takes 10 minutes because you're booting a machine a few times, but it works fine. You have an infrastructure for running individual tests. You have an infrastructure for running test suites. You have infrastructure to you know, report results and assert on things or that things roughly equal. Like you know, if you do a bunch of instructions to measure what CPU frequency you're actually running at, there's a little bit of an error right there between what the chip you, know, you set it to, but you, know, you can do all of that. And after I you know, put in a whole bunch of state, because if I just ma manufacture it to one big Python script, I can keep state between individual test case runs as opposed to, you know, 4,000 forks and 8,000 Perl processes. Uh, so I can keep state. For example, don't reboot the machine unless you intend to. Don't have each test turn the machine off to a known state, then boot it, then run 10 commands, then turn it off again. So I took what the existing test suite took 12 hours and I converted that down to 20 minutes. And as a maintainer, I can run something for 20 minutes. That seems a very good smoke test. And then I could have the test teams run more extended tests that would run for longer and test you know, more things there. But you know, 20 minutes is a, is a good thing. Uh, it also is great when you say, hey, that test suite you're running. So you can write a whole lot of tests now because I've now just made your machine free for an extra you know, 11 and a half hours a day. And they certainly appreciated that because pre-release hardware, there's limited amounts. So the more, the more you can test the same thing and the less time, the better. Uh, and so what did we write this in? Well, I chose Python 2.7. Python 3 is ridiculous because it changes everything and is not installed on RHEL 6 and everyone's distros properly. So therefore, 2.7 it is because everyone has that. And also, there is very extensive documentation on programming Python 2.7. It's not something hard to learn. And you know, someone will eventually convert it to Python 3 after we get rid of RHEL 6. But it's a different whole thing of using a spoon to change an organization. Uh, and getting you know, teams to embrace modern infrastructure is a different battle and you know, spoons. Uh, we also don't use fancy Python libraries. If it's not installed by default, I don't use it because pip is another thing. It's terrible because it's another thing you have to do to run something. And this isn't you know, something I'm installing once and doing it. It's something we are constantly updating. So I want git clone dot slash run, right? Uh, I have a few different requirements on the on the host, so we also do a whole bunch of tests. You know, in the Linux kernel, we have in firmware, but you know, you install Ubuntu or Red Hat on the machine. It's just like you install these list of ten packages because you know, we use the uh, Ubuntu or the canonical firmware test suite because we run a whole bunch of stuff in band because that's where you should write it. Uh, we want you know our power specific utilities, the Opal PRD and Opal utils, and we want to do I squared C stuff and the like. So this was my desired workflow to say anyone git clone this repo go into the directory, run it, and tell it how to log in, and tell it which firmware image you want to test, and at the end, come back 20 minutes later and says, you know, pass fail. Uh, we had a lot of machines to test, so of course we want abstractions in all of this, and Python does nice object-oriented magic things there to make that kind of nice when you're talking to BMCs that have completely different APIs, or remarkably similar ones, but IPMI is a lovely standard and everyone has their own twist. Uh, we also want to run in simulators because that's useful for new machines and also other unit tests. So what do tests look like? Well, here's the test that checks if you can boot up to a shell in firmware, the Petty Boot shell. So it's like, make the machine boot. And if that's it, well, that's good, because we have a little state machine that keeps track of what state the computer's meant to be in, and we can drive it there. Uh, you want to boot 1,024 times, this will do it. 
and capture a bit of firmware log around that. Um, uh, I believe someone has actually booted a machine a thousand times, and that's Nick Piggin. I think he's the only one who's done it using a different patch to make us reboot quicker. Um, but you know, we can just run nice little Python code because we have Python. You can write wonderful things. Uh, this is another interesting thing. Uh, we use a, we have the drop bear SSH client in Pettyboot. We probably don't want to run an SSH server in your bootloader, like at least not by default. So you know, we just go to the shell and run ps and see what it is. Um, we might want to do uh, frequency checking. So this goes and pokes things on the host of CPU frequency and measures it remotely. Um, Seems like a sane thing. If you say only run at two gigahertz, you expect the chip to run at two gigahertz. Mention it. Cool. Uh, we need workarounds for Python because not everyone has the same versions of Python and all the libraries. So you get to do silly things like go into a library and I know that variable there. I'll just batch that for you because the option isn't in what everyone runs. But the whole goal is here to have everyone be able to just git clone and run it, right? So it's whatever you have in your OS. Uh, you know, sometimes bash in, on machines is helpful and puts color. So if you're like grepping the output of consoles, it's terrible when you suddenly have color codes in there. So you're like, oh, we'll just run with no profile. Then we'll exec things and something else. It's uh, annoying. Uh, we wrap pexpect uh, because uh, there's Python expect library. So we wrap that to capture things like kernel oopses, kernel panics. Uh, you know, asserts from firmware. Uh, we can poke at uh, the service processor to say, has the machine check stopped? Which is when the CPU just gives up and says everything's terrible. Uh, you know, we want to catch those conditions and fail the test quickly, so then we can turn the machine off or capture data and then run the next test. Especially during bring up, right? Things are going to be broken, so you want to reiterate that too. So we have a wonderful p wonderful p expect wrapper uh, there that captures all of these things and grabs it to a log. Uh, we can also write torture tests because we've got you know, a fully-fledged programming environment. So this was an actual customer bug uh, where a, the IPMI daemon on uh, their service processor would occasionally go away. And we worked out a bit of what workload they were doing. And so we got our test guide to run a whole bunch of uh, threads uh, that did harmless IPMI commands, just getting information. So we'd run like 10 threads of those, all doing them in different orders and different amounts. And then we'd trigger a whole bunch of activity on the IPMI serial over land console. And we'd just run this for a while until the service processor went away and didn't come back. And this ended up being a bug in the service processor code there. But us being able to use you know, this firmware test thing to hand it to them meant they could fix it. And that makes a customer happy. And that really sort of gave a lot of visibility to the project. And this is an idea is like when you solve a real customer problem, it's not just you know, hacking away on something random. It's a here is something that has distinct value and helped us get a fix out quicker. My best test for breaking consoles is find slash. Because <laughs> um, that can often result in this when the BMC just sort of gives up and, and goes away. Uh, or it can just like hold a whole bunch of characters go missing. Uh, the short version is BMCs are terrible. Um, so hopefully OpenBMC fixes that for us and we all run open source BMCs and it's fantastic. Um, you know, we can do things like work around it. So, oh, you get disconnected, so therefore you try and fail the command you're running before. And then part of that is like reset the BMC if it doesn't work too. And that kind of workarounds terrible things because I want to test my host firmware. My job is not to fix your BMC implementation. A 20 megabit serial port versus the TTY layer. Um, <laughs> 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 Turns out that works uh, less well than you think. Uh, so, you know, this is a wonderful test case. I could say, hey, Jeremy, I found this bug. And he's like, actually, it's three, one of which is core TTY layer code. This is going to be fun. Um, and so, you know, that does it. Uh, current state test coverage, we're improving. Like, new tests are getting there. We don't test everything, but we're getting there. I haven't gone and plugged in an automatic get out the GCOV thing yet, but it's, uh, we're dearly hoping. Uh, adoption. Buy-in is really good from developers. I don't know anyone who like, uses the manual firmware update process anymore. They use this. There's a command line where you like, just give them the firmware file and then any parts of firmware you've run. So this is what I run. Right? I run, here's my config file, which tells the passwords to the machine to log into the console and what IP addresses it's at. I say, you know, I want a new ski boot, which is you know, the bit I'm testing on whether I merge someone's code. And then I've got you know, the daily build of the actual rest of the firmware, and it just 
no matter what, we'll make sure that you are running your firmware and then we'll turn everything off and turn everything on. And there's also a test to install Ubuntu. So I have a really efficient scripted way from turning your computer into my computer <laughs> on every level. Because there's also another thing, you could flash the BMC as well. So it's just kind of like I've taken every bit of possible executable code on your computer and now it's mine. So I'm one typo away from making someone's life terrible. Uh, so, you know, on adoption thing, they're really good from developers, uh, really good from some of our test teams who are writing a lot of the tests and, and new code in there. Um, I've been tested at least three times this week to merge new test cases. Um, and one of the guys there is the key author there has, for one of our platforms, literally submitted one out of eight bugs. There is more than eight people doing it. So that's like high productivity gains right there. Uh, yeah, so it's up at github.com, OpenPower, OPS, OPTS framework, and of course the OpenPower stuff there. Uh, and at least uh, my firmware and my firmware's test suite is like open source and up on GitHub. Um, if yours isn't, that seems really weird to me. So yeah, like really? People don't just build their firmware from source and then run the test suite that's open source on it and then patch it? Yeah, but you can with power and this is what we're doing. So if you get power, Come and do it, and thank you. Thank you, Stuart. And, uh, a oh, thank gift. you. Um, we have about a uh, few minutes uh, for questions, if there are any. And uh, Stuart, if you could repeat the questions when they come. Yes, up. sure. Let's go. Ah, let's go left to right. Sure. Have I managed to but completely I brick a system? by flashing crazy firmware. Yes, we have to get a different hardware debugger and plug it in and reprogram the CPROM of the thing that starts your main chip, yes. Okay, but it's possible Yeah, because you have extra debug tools, because, you know, fabbing new chips is annoying. Uh, depends, depends on it, and we're trying to make it so you can do it through different interfaces. Um, so uh, there is a wonderful little open source tool that works on other BMCs that don't have the drivers there by like bit banging out a debug protocol by you opening dev mem. So you can sort of recover things when you do brick something totally. And it's very rare that you can actually brick something that hard. Power is responsibility. Yeah, it's like, you know, if it does, then we should work out how we can unbrick it and do that because that's a, a feature that we want. Yeah. Cool. Uh, back, yeah. Is there any cheap way of getting into playing with power? It's like the Talos 2 system uh, is out and available. Uh, the board is a bit more expensive than you know, you'd probably like. Um, and I would tell you that each of us is very loud. Uh, each of us in Oslabs especially is very loud about wanting a developer workstation that's at a nice good price point. Um, but it also helps if you are, and you should totally badger Hugh over there about it as well. And he will have it as like, you know, open found foundation versus an excellent thing because I want it at my desk at home. Why would I not run all my storage running off a box where I can totally update the firmware? Because that's exactly what you want in a NAS, is <laughs> so many things. Cool. Steve? Um, are you Uh, the question was, you know, are we stuck with proprietary tool, tooling to patch the box or do we have all the open ways down to the consumer? Um, depending on who you buy your machine from, uh, flashing your own firmware may void your warranty, um, which is part of it. And most people do consume it from, from their vendor. But I can tell you that every single open power machine that has shipped, uh, that tool will flash a firmware you build from it. Uh, and we'll do it with you know, enough open sourcey tools, or you can do other bits to work around it. Uh, there is one or two where it's a little bit trickier because um, they try and protect you from flashing random files onto Flash, uh, but you can do it through the host. Uh, so you can work around it there. So it's, it's kind of, and we want to expand that. We want to have it better for people to be able to do that and it have like one way of updating firmware, not like four, because that's just nuts. And one more question, I think. Cool, we've had one here from uh, something. How are we handling the fizzling, uh, physical aspects of testing? Um, uh, does not as all count with an answer? So we, we've got like, we, we turn the machine off BMC, right? That's really powering on and off the host. Uh, yeah, usually those other bugs come 
to light anyway. Like LEDs is something that we need to obviously have a solution for. Uh, I'm thinking, I don't know, cameras and image recognition, because why not? How do we test like things are coming out of a physical VGA port? We're going to have to have some kind of video capture at some point, or convince the world that VGA is terrible and they should stop that and fix it with super glue. Um, <laughs> no, you want to. Yeah, yeah, fixing, definitely fixing. <laughs> but, but yeah, so there's still work to do in that regard. So we do have people who will manually do that, and you know, we've had the odd bug that wasn't caught, like the slot was mislabeled, but you know, it's a, it's a process. It's not perfect. And with that, please thank Stuart again. Thank you.